everybody. It's, uh, I'm not surprised we have a full house here tonight. It's a really great subject. It's coming up in a few minutes. Uh, I wanted to welcome you on behalf of Miami Design Preservation League. And um, are there any other history majors in the room? Yeah. <laughs> Because what I find really interesting uh, for Art Deco Weekend this year is um, we're delving into so much untold history or unknown history. And that's what we're going to be doing in a few minutes. Uh, I studied architecture. I never heard the names of these women we're going to hear about in a few minutes. Um, another thing I would like to encourage you all to do is absolutely cannot miss the exhibit that's currently up at the MDPL headquarters, which is like a block and a half away on Ocean Drive and 10th. And that's uh, more unknown history, I think, for many of us, um, how women got the vote. And uh, there's some really startling details. Uh, you really must catch this. Um, what's very refreshing is it's, uh, it's not written in any kind of identity jargon. It's not preachy at all. It's how women got the vote. And you will be startled by the panels on untold history and some of the individuals. So, Please uh, make a point of going to see that. And um, MDPL, of course, we're very interested in history, but I wanted to point out that uh, we're not just about nostalgia and about saving 1920s buildings. We're trying to be relevant and pertinent today, and we go to city hall meetings, and we try to get involved in maybe slowing down overdevelopment and stopping some really... <laughs> Stopping some of the really stupid demolitions and, uh, you know, looking at new projects that might get built. So, because of that, I'm hoping some of you would consider supporting us at MDPL. This is very high tech. This is a hologram. It's all caps. That's what I didn't realize. <laughs> okay, all caps. If you would like to uh, contribute to MDPL and become a member, it's only 25 bucks this weekend. And all you have to do is. Uh, Type in Art Deco in capitals and 44321 on your phone, and you can join us. And you get a free poster or a free tour. And you get a free poster or a free tour. <coughs> so thank you so much, history, the present, the future. And uh, let's welcome the director of the Wolfsonian, who is going to make a presentation of our speakers. <coughs> Welcome everyone, I'm Tim Rogers, and yes, I am the fortunate person that gets to be the director of the Wolfsonian. It's kind of, it is wonderful, it's a wonderful job, a wonderful place. It is really, truly like inheriting everything your grandparents acquired for the last 500 years. <laughs> now it's your responsibility to take care of it. So one of the things that I thought when I first came here to the Wolfsonian, actually it was during the interview process, I asked, what do we do with Art Deco Weekend? It seemed like such a natural collaboration. And I wanted to know, like, how is it that we could create more of a relationship with MDPL? And so over the five years that I've been here, we have been forging this relationship, making it deeper and deeper, and this is the result. We are extremely happy that so many people are turning out for these lectures here at the Wolfsonian and that we get to partner with MDPL. It really has been, I think, a very fruitful relationship. And today, in particular, you're really witnessing the strength of the staff here at the Wolfsonian. You heard from Lee Nicholas early, our, earlier, our research curator, who gave a wonderful talk on unknown aviators, or at least unknown to me, maybe very well known to others. And now you're going to have the privilege of hearing from our senior curator, Sylvia Verasoni, and our <coughs> other curator, Shoshana Resnikoff. And so you are going to be seeing the talents of the Wolfsonian team. I also want to point out someone who's no longer part of the Wolfsonian team, but that was so helpful in creating this series of talks, and that's Danielle Bender in the back. They came back to us just to help with this series of talks, and we appreciate that, Danielle. It was very kind of you. 
So today we're going to be hearing from the two curators. Um, one will follow the other. Uh, I'd like to think that they do this together, um, but it's not going to happen that way. Sylvia Barassoni is, I think, known to most of you. She has been here the longer of the two, and I think that many of you came to two of her most recent exhibitions, Dutch Design and Made in Italy. I think any of you who have been to one of Sylvia's shows know that she's a real stickler for detail. She does incredible research, and she has a wonderful eye. She really picks out really beautiful pieces and presents them to all of us. And so today, Sylvia is going to be talking about the Dutch architect, Margaret Stahl Propoller. And she was part of the Amsterdam School, which is a variant of Art Deco style in Amsterdam. So that will be first. And it will be followed by Shoshana Resnikoff, and she is our curator here, and our newer curator, or one of our newer curators, I should say. And you are most familiar with her work because on the sixth and seventh floor are two shows that she co-curated. And so I encourage you to go up and see Deco, an incredibly beautiful show. And then A Universe of Things, which, you know, tackle the immensity of this collection. You know we have over 200,000 things in this collection, and when you're a new curator like Shoshana, and suddenly you're confronted with 200,000 things, and you have a director say, make sense of it, please, and then she did that. And so we really welcome her to Wolfsonian, and she is doing wonderful things. We'll do even more in the future. So she is going to be speaking today about the Prairie School architect, Marion Mahoney Griffin, and she created work in the United States, of course, but around the world as well. And so I think you'll all be very curious to know more about these two wonderful architects. And so, Sylvia, are you starting first? I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you team, thank you Kulti for the presentation and uh, uh, thank you for coming uh, tonight on a Saturday night to, to listen to us. Um, so Margaret Stalker-Poller was a Dutch architect. There is not much written on her in English. Uh, the only monograph was in uh, Dutch and uh, luckily there was a, uh, an architect at the School of Architecture in Genoa who wrote her master dissertation in Italian that helped a lot. And um, there are some um, information about her um, in uh, general books on the Amsterdam School and mostly uh, was, has been researched by Marianne uh, Groth, who has been uh, a fellow at the Wilsonian and uh, unfortunately she passed away last uh, uh, summer. So I want to thank uh, really her work that she has done with us and for us at the Wilsonian on our Dutch collection. Um, Margaret Starkropoller um, was a, 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 an architect uh, born in uh, Harlem, Harlem, uh, the Netherlands, in uh, 1891. She came from a family um, of artists uh, because, uh, well, her father actually was a real estate agent, but all her brothers uh, were, the first one was a, uh, trained as a carpenter and then he became an architect. Uh, and she started to work uh, with him, and then uh, two others were musicians, and the last uh, sister was a designer, um, a drawing a teacher. Uh, <clears throat> so she, uh, she's really the first architect to, um, the first female architect in the Netherlands. Uh, she started to work when she was, uh, her first uh, um, job uh, was in, uh, when she was 22, but she started to work before, uh, after school uh, with, uh, in the um, office of her brother, Co, Co Kropoller, uh, in Amsterdam, and uh, his partner, uh, Fritz Stahl. Um, so the story uh, is a bit, uh, there, uh, there was a family drama because when she started to, uh, to work, uh, her, uh, her brother was uh, uh, 10 years older and uh, Fritz Stahl was 12 years older and he was a, ma a married man. But uh, naturally, she was a cute uh, young architect, and um, so uh, in the end, the freestyle was attracted to her, and uh, the, um, uh, she became uh, uh, part of the of the team. Uh, her brother uh, left, 
and uh, she became uh, um, also the uh, Fritz Stahl partner, but also uh, part, um, in life and uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in his job. So they were really, um, it was a, a dramatic uh, situation and they never could uh, get married until uh, 1936. So in the beginning she just uh, signed as Margaret Kropoller. After 1936 she began to sign as uh, Margaret Stahl Kropoller. Uh, but it's very interesting that, uh, so, naturally there were no women architects, but in the Watsonian collection we have uh, this uh, panel that you probably saw if you came to visit the Dutch, modern Dutch design exhibition. Uh, there was, we have the complete uh, interior for uh, a room designed by Theo Nuvenhaus uh, for a, a, a lawyer in Amsterdam, and on the sides of this uh, fireplace uh, uh, there are two mosaics representing one that was representing music, this, uh, the other one architecture, and we have a, you, a woman to represent it. And uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this image explains really the uh, approach, the Dutch approach to design, which was very geometric. Uh, nature is uh, reduced to geometric uh, uh, shapes. In fact, she's tracing a, um, a circle with a compass. Um, but at the time uh, uh, there were no women architects uh, and most of them were uh, uh, textile desi uh, designers, uh, most of them worked uh, with batik which came from uh, uh, the Dutch East Indies and uh, was uh, really uh, used by uh, women and men um, on uh, textile and also on parchment and then used for covers uh, of uh, books and we, uh, as you know we have uh, the, in the collection, in the library collection a great uh, um, Collect, uh, a great uh, series of these uh, uh, batik parchment uh, covers. Um, so this uh, focus on uh, uh, geometry was also influenced by uh, theoso uh, the theosophical studies. Most of these architects, Dutch architects and artists at the time, um, followed the theo uh, theo theosophical theories about uh, geometry. The world is. Uh, uh, based on uh, geometric uh, proportions uh, and in fact also in uh, the design. This was a very popular uh, uh, manual at the time uh, written by uh, Jan Hessel, an architect, and uh, his sister, a needlework uh, artist. Um, and uh, uh, naturally artists and uh, architects follow these uh, uh, manuals uh, and you can see one of the first uh, drawings uh, by Margaret Kropoller when she was uh, still attending uh, a, a day drawing uh, a school for girls in uh, in Amsterdam. This is a um, like you can see how she designs, uh, why well, she creates uh, uh, patterns based on uh, geometry, like uh, natural uh, patterns based on uh, geometry. Um, so she started to work in the studio Kropoller Stahl Studio in uh, uh, eighteen uh, uh, nine. Uh, sorry, uh, 1907. Uh, in the beginning, she was just um, designing mostly wallpapers, uh, uh, stances, and uh, uh, interiors. And in, um, uh, 18, in, in 1913, she was uh, selected uh, to design the uh, interior, the modern interior, like the um, model of a, a house interior for the 1913 woman exhibition in Amsterdam. Uh, she presented her, her drawing as uh, um, Greta Derling with, under a pseudonym. Uh, the poster is very interesting because again you can see like this symmetry, uh, this uh, very like uh, strict uh, geometric composition. Uh, it was um, uh, the exhibition that celebrated uh, 100 years of independence of the Netherlands from uh, the French and also was uh, organized by a group of women we, uh, who were supporting uh, women's uh, suffrage. Um, in the Netherlands women got uh, like, uh, suffrage in um, uh, 1919, just uh, for your uh, information. Uh, so these were the interiors that uh, uh, Greta Derling, alias uh, Margaret Kropoller, designed. As you can see, there is uh, still uh, the influence of the arts and crafts. They are very. Um, she's very always uh, attentive to the, um, like the, 
uh, to design a very practical interiors, except uh, especially as far as concerns the, the kitchen. And um, these are some of the drawings which are uh, preserved at the, in the collection of at uh, Nive Institute in Rotterdam. Uh, you can see the like from the drawings uh, they are really uh, very. Um, uh, simple lines that you can uh, you can uh, uh, see also in the tea cutter, which is in the Watsonian collection. Uh, if you think of the design of uh, Christopher Dresser, who was a bit uh, like uh, earlier, um, it's really a, a very simple lines that to show the the structure of the uh, like the form is given by the structure, as in this uh, chair, famous chair by Berlage, which is still in the Watsonian collection. Uh, where you can see that the studs, for example, are, uh, the, the brass studs are uh, like put in evidence uh, and um, because it's really the, uh, the structure that uh, gives uh, uh, the form uh, to the chair. Uh, Berlagen actually was the main uh, figure at the time, at the turn of the century. Uh, all uh, uh, architects uh, followed him. He did, he's famous especially for uh, the birth in uh, Amsterdam. <laughs> Um, as you can imagine, all the all the buildings in uh, Amsterdam are usually made out of brick because uh, that's the material where uh, that they use. And um, the the other uh, important architect of the period was uh, uh, Edward Kuipers. Uh, he was also the professor of Margaret Kropoll when she attended the Academy of Architecture in Amsterdam. She attended the Academy, but she never got a degree. Anyway, she could practice, uh, uh, could practice as an architect, uh, as also her brother was uh, actually trained as a carpenter. Uh, Edward Kuipers was uh, uh, is very important because he has a, a more multifaceted uh, approach compared to uh, Berlage, who was interested in uh, the influence of, from the um, Dutch East Indies in uh, Art Deco, uh, sorry, Art Nouveau in, uh, in the Vienna Secession. And uh, he uh, founded a magazine, uh, uh, Het, Het Huiz, uh, the house, uh, which was about uh, decorative arts and um, um, and uh, the inter interior, and he had a group of uh, uh, students working for him, where the, um, who became then the founders of the Amsterdam School. Uh, Jan van der May, uh, Michael de Klerk, and Piet Kramer. Uh, they, uh, they are famous for building, uh, first of all, the uh, ship, uh, Shepard Hughes, which is the shipping house, actually, as a translation. Maybe it's better that they just say the English because when I say the Dutch, it's always a, a bit pathetic. But anyway, uh, the shipping house is uh, in a way the manifesto of uh, uh, the Amsterdam School. It was built in 19, uh, started in 1911, and it was uh, um, made for uh, six uh, uh, shipping companies. And if you look at the shape of the the building, it looks like a, like a ship. And uh, this kind of architecture is really. Uh, very um, is, is very plastic. The, the it looks almost like a sculpture, and it's really full of sculptures. Uh, and uh, if you uh, if you think of the um, uh, expressionist uh, German architecture, uh, there is a connection because they are both very emotional. Like the architect express uh, like his emotions uh, through the architecture. And uh, so that's uh, the line of the Amsterdam School. And um, um, the chandelier, which is a beautiful piece from, uh, that we, we have in the collection from uh, um, the shipping house, uh, is uh, really um, one of the, um, of, of, uh, the um, interesting pieces that we have by Michel de Klerk in the collection. Uh, just to, to show you one second the, the dome, the cupola, if you think it's 1914 and 15, and you think now uh, of Art Deco, really there are many elements that, uh, like the zigzag motifs, uh, and um, also like this uh, very uh, geometric composition, uh, uh, like forces uh, the Art Deco from the 1920s. Uh, the group was uh, of the Amsterdam School architects. Uh, they um, were uh, they gathered uh, uh, around the uh, the group, which was called Architectura uh, and Amicizia, um, and they um, they founded a magazine, Vendingen, which means uh, changes. 
uh, which started in 1918, uh, founded by Wiedenfeld, uh, by, uh, and went on until 1931. Um, so they were really, they wanted to uh, bring uh, art to everybody, they wanted to beautify the city, they wanted the uh, working class to be able to live in, a, uh, yes, in affordable buildings, but then uh, their magazine was really very uh, luxury, if you can, uh, if you can see the, the binding with the Japanese binding, every uh, number, every month had a new designer, and they were really like made uh, uh, in a very uh, sophisticated and uh, luxur uh, luxurious way. Uh, anyway, on uh, Bendingen in uh, 1918, uh, the first project by um, uh, Margaret Kropoller is uh, published. It was a park uh, in Bergen, a uh, ski resort north of uh, Amsterdam where a group of architects, among them also Stahl, were invited by an um, industrialist, a tile producer from Amsterdam, Arnold Eiste, to, uh, to build a group of houses. Uh, this is the uh, Villa Birkenhock, that um, uh, means uh, uh, beach tree corner. The shape is more, uh, again, inspired by the sh uh, ship shape. And uh, uh, if you look at the architecture, again, you think of the arts and crafts. Uh, and also this idea of a group of houses in a park uh, reminds us of the uh, Kunstler colonies in uh, Darmstadt or Essen. Uh, unfortunately, the house has been um, uh, burned, was um, destroyed by a fire, and this is the new version. But if you look at the... Uh, and this is the bridge that she designed to connect to the other um, two houses, which were semi-detached houses. And um, so this is the, uh, the second house. On the back there is the mare house, but uh, you can see from the plan that it's two, um, it's two houses, actually. And uh, this uh, motif of the two uh, ch uh, chimneys in, uh, in the front, actually it reminds me of the building, which is uh, like uh, um, here on Washington. Uh, well, it's a building from the 50s, but with the motif of the three uh, towers. I don't know, yes, that's what reminds me, but it just uh, is not the same function. Anyway, this is a journey. And uh, this is the, the villa, how it's now, so it's a very well uh, with the, uh, like the cane uh, roof. It's, I mean, it's uh, still in very good condition, and you can see some of the details, really very, this is uh, sculptural uh, uh, corners. Uh, this was the only uh, drawing that I could find, uh, um, which is for a stained glass window. But I wanted to show you the interior because it's uh, quite uh, unexpected. But you have to remember that the client was a uh, tile uh, pro uh, producer, so he, uh, he wanted uh, to use his material. And so uh, this is uh, her, um, her house, and um, one of the two houses. And this is the interior of uh, the house by Blau. Uh, I wanted to show you just to, to see like this uh, combination of colors which are very strong. The Amsterdam School architects were very always using brick outside, but inside they used a lot of colors. And also looking at the stained glass, they are very like uh, always produced by the same guy who was a uh, man who was the one who also made the stained glass windows in the uh, shipping house. Uh, second, uh, um, um, uh, important commission was uh, the atelier for uh, Roland uh, Holst, who was an artist. This is a, a, a sec um, another part of the, the same building, but there is always a, a, a kind of a symmetry in, uh, in their projects. And uh, in uh, <coughs> the clerk who was uh, the leader of the Amsterdam School, he, in, in, uh, he uh, fortunately died very young in uh, 1923. Uh, uh, um, Margaret Kropoller designed uh, the cover for uh, his uh, um, for uh, the Bendingen, which was dedicated uh, to him. And this is the, the famous uh, uh, living room that he designed in 1916, and was uh, it's in our collection and was uh, presented at the Exposition des Arts Décoratifs in uh, Paris, 1925. Um, you can see uh, naturally the influence from the uh, Dutch East Indies in his uh, uh, in his furniture. 
and uh, this is a, an image of the furniture on display in Paris. Uh, it's really contradictory that they design for the work, like architecture for the working class, but then they are curious where it's super uh, luxury with this uh, incredible wood quality. And um, uh, Fritz Stahl designed uh, the, pa uh, the pavilion, uh, the Dutch pavilion uh, for uh, um, for uh, the, the Paris exhibition. That's why, I mean, uh, we are talking about the Amsterdam School, which is not properly Art Deco, but it was really what uh, the Netherlands presented in, um, in Paris. If you think that uh, in the, the same time, uh, the movement, uh, the style, uh, was already born in, uh, um, in the Netherlands. It was again nine, uh, around 1917 uh, that uh, Van Doesburg with Mondrian and Ritter uh, they created uh, the style. But uh, they were not invited to participate in, uh, in Paris and it was just uh, the, um, the Amsterdam school. And on that occasion, uh, Margaret Kropoller got a silver medal for her uh, uh, architecture and a bronze medal as a graphic designer. Uh, this is just to show you uh, how like the Amsterdam uh, school uh, in uh, 1919 was really like the uh, the style of the city and then um, uh, spread through throughout the um, country this is the famous theater Tuschinski which is uh, like over the top always very exuberant uh, and uh, but it still is a movie theater in uh, uh, in Amsterdam and this is the program from, um, from our collection where you can see even the, the interior, uh, the colors are very strong and uh, the, um, the, the design area was uh, Yap Gidding, was uh, again a very multifaceted uh, 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 artist and uh, designer. Um, the last pro big project uh, in the 1920s uh, for uh, housing blocks by uh, Margaret Krupoller was published in 1927 and it was in uh, Amsterdam West. Uh, West. Uh, it was uh, like the, uh, this, the, um, uh, the buildings had to be all uh, five story, uh, story buildings while in the other uh, uh, project uh, there were four story buildings. And uh, I forgot to tell you an important thing is that uh, uh, these architects just designed the facade. It was really a kind of um, uh, uh, mask architecture, like the critics were teasing them, but it was really this idea that uh, at least uh, the facade had to be uh, uh, like uh, pleased the eyes, and uh, inside there were very small apartments, uh, but at least uh, like the, even the courtyards and the gardens, they were all very much curated by the, architecture, uh, by the architects of the Amsterdam School. So this is the, um, the, sec the project of uh, Amsterdam West with the, the two towers by Berlage. And uh, this is the project by Margaret Kropoller. You can see that she's a bit more, like uh, her uh, line has become more um, uh, like uh, 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 straight and uh, uh, the use of, um, um, the use of, still a use of uh, brick, but also the, she, she had some, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, zigzag uh, um, facade, and also she adds uh, some. Uh, what did you show? Yes, uh, some. Uh, she differentiates the uh, bricks using uh, the uh, Groningen brick, which is much uh, um, pur uh, purple for the first floor. Um, so. In, in the 1920s, like the Amsterdam School was uh, critics at the time, I consider it a very local uh, um, movement. In fact, it, it spread uh, mostly in the, in, in the um, Netherlands and not uh, didn't become an international uh, movement. So uh, in, uh, in, at the end of the 1920s, uh, the movement uh, was over and uh, naturally architects of the style or uh, functionalist architects hated it and forgot about it. And it has been rediscovered in the 1950s. Um, uh, Margaret Kropoller in the 1930s, she went on uh, um, being an architect, but uh, she, like her design became much more uh, functionalist. You can see this is a project for uh, uh, Fox, uh, in, leather store in Amsterdam. You can see how she also uh, plays with the graphic. And this is the final uh, um, uh, 
project. Uh, the use of color is always very, very particular. Uh, she uses uh, like bright, we can't see it, but bright blue and uh, uh, bronze, uh, like golden bronze, and, the, um, uh, and then black uh, tiles. And uh, in um, and then she collaborates with uh, Stahl. Usually they worked, uh, they uh, they didn't work together on the projects. But uh, in the case of uh, she um, she did the, the cover for a, a special issue on this on uh, Stahl, and uh, they published uh, in this uh, um, issue the uh, the birds, uh, so the stock exchange in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, where well, she collaborated in the interiors, uh, in, uh, in the foyer, and these are some drawings of uh, um, chairs. Unfortunately, I didn't find any other good drawings in the archives uh, in, uh, in Rotterdam. Uh, so I would like just to, to stop because she was active until the 1960s, uh, but we're talking now about more the period which was uh, like the Amsterdam School, which corresponds to the um, uh, Art Deco period. I just wanted to end up with this uh, uh, image because it's true that uh, um, Margaret Kropoller was the only architect at the time, but we, we often forget that uh, the famous uh, Rietveld House was actually uh, designed by uh, Rietveld, who was a, a, again, he was a carpenter, a cabinet maker in the beginning, and then he became an architect. And uh, he was much helped by his client, who was uh, Truss Schroeder Schroeder, who was a socialite, but also very, uh, she knew a lot about art, and uh, uh, so she helped him. So they, uh, we should say that the project was uh, by Rietveld and by Truss Schroeder, and not just, but we always uh, try and tend to remember the name of the man and forget the women. Thank you. <laughs> because those pictures were so beautiful. <laughs> um, but hopefully uh, this will also be uh, fascinating for you guys as well. Um, I wanted to talk today about Marion Mahoney Griffin, who is uh, really the, the primary woman architect of the Prairie School. Um, and in uh, October of 1915, in an article in the Sydney Daily Telegraph, uh, Marion Mahoney Griffin gives her take on women in the field of architecture. She says, it was necessary for women to take up work in the same spirit as men did. If we wanted anything in the world, we must pay the price for it. And to succeed in the more interesting lines meant the greater effort. As men did, so a woman must. Work daytimes, nighttimes. It must form the basis of her dreams. She must give it her Saturdays and her Sundays and go without holidays. Any real accomplishment always means a life's devotion. I will be really honest with you guys. I find Marion to be a mystery. Um, she was when I started this research project, and now that I'm presenting you, her to you, she continues to be a mystery. Um, she's a woman who is passionately committed to the field of architecture, uh, determined to succeed and even surpass the men around her. Uh, she's an uncompromising architect, raised in a uh, pioneering feminist community. She has a disposition so fiery that she and her superior, Frank Lloyd Wright, used to get into screaming matches in the Wright studio. Um, and she's also a devoted wife and a professional partner to another architect, Walter Burley Griffin, who, you know, there's discussion about this, I personally feel is a slightly less talented architect than she is, though they're both very talented. Um, and for their entire partnership, she happily gives credit for the lion's share of her work to him. Um, it's hard for me, certainly as a 21st century researcher, and also frankly as a millennial, uh, to square this passionate call to arms uh, of a woman architect. Um, uh, with the reality that she regularly and, and willingly, like I said, sublimated her work uh, and reputation to that of her husband. But that's the truth, and that's what I want to explore today. Um, so we're going to explore her work with Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, her productive partnership with Walter. Um, I call them by their first names because calling them Griffin and Griffin gets really confusing, so I hope that's okay that I'm taking that liberty. Um, and as well as their projects that span the globe, uh, starting in the United States and going as far as Australia and India. Um, it's hard to glean what was her projects and what were his. They did truly work in concert with each other. And as I said, um, she willingly gave credit to him. Uh, but there are a couple of projects that I feel pretty confident she was the lead on. And so I'm gonna uh, talk about those. 
Um, but then ultimately I'd like to conclude with how I've come to terms with Marion um, uh, and uh, how we can understand her not just as a woman architect but truly as a partner um, uh, in the deepest sense of the word. She's born in 1871 in Chicago, Illinois. Um, people who know their history will know that that's the year of the Great Chicago Fire. And in fact, she's actually rescued from the fire in a clothes basket. Her parents whisk her out of the house while their neighborhood is burning around them. Um, they move to the North Shore uh, of Chicago, Winnetka, uh, to be precise. And now Winnetka is known for its, its grand mansions, but at that point, um, it was rural, and so she grew up surrounded by, uh, by forests on the shores of, of Lake Michigan with the wind rushing around her. Um, and I think that that sort of uh, environment kind of deeply embedded in nature informs all of her work uh, going forward. Her father dies young in 1882, and her mother, Clara, joins the Chicago Women's Club, which was a progressive women's organization that advocated for labor rights, uh, children, uh, labor reform, uh, and universal education, and of course, suffrage. Um, these, this was a circle of powerful women that she would have grown up uh, within, um, and they likely had an impact on her and her understanding of her own potential. Um, she moves to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she enrolls in MIT. Uh, she is one of eight women in the class of 270 freshmen, and she also becomes the only the second woman to earn a Bachelor of Architecture from the university. Um, the, the woman before her, whose name I'm blanking on sadly, uh, built the women's building at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. So that's the sort of legacy and uh, milieu she's working in. Uh, she returns to Chicago where she gets a job uh, uh, in her cousin Dwight Perkins' architecture studio in 1894. She meets Frank Lloyd Wright. Within a year, she's joined his newly formed studio. Um, and, and is one of his earliest employees. Um, she also becomes close friends with uh, Catherine Wright, Wright uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's first wife, um, uh, uh, seen here um, looking at the, at the camera, and then uh, there, there's Marion again in profile. If anyone was here for the conversation about Hildreth Meir, um, you're gonna see a lot of Marion in profile. She's where this started for me, this whole thing interesting recent potential research topic about women in profile. So, um, uh, she's famous in the studio for her wit, her brash personality, um, and also her willingness, like I said, to fight with Wright, um, arguing against ideas she didn't agree with, um, and also pushing back on his repeated overbearing personality. Um, but she, she is hired primarily for her drafting skills, and we will get into that. Uh, but she did design architecture uh, for Wright as well. Um, you can see here the loggia to the Oak Park studio, um, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright's studio in Oak Park. This was an addition in 1909, um, and she uh, did the, uh, designed the, the columns. Um, that's a tree of knowledge, and then actually, I don't know where the pointer is, so this might not work, but um, you can see uh, there's the plans for the studio embedded in the, in the loggia, in the, in the column, if you can see that. Um, uh, so she also uh, does a lot of the art glass designs for his early projects here at the Roby House. She's responsible for this um, art glass installation. Uh, her work is famous for the way that it um, crosses from window to window to create this kind of larger hole. So you see it as one artwork as opposed to a repeated uh, a motif. Um, uh, and she also is uh, responsible for uh, what we think of as this like classic right, uh, right and prairie school design where she breaks out of the box and you get that T-shape with the wings on the side. Um, uh, she, she writes later that her amusement was still to break further from the parallelogram. And so she's constantly uh, experimenting with that form. Um, she also experiments with isolating the bedrooms to just one section of the second floor, which allows most of the public living spaces to be double height. So what we think of as being this traditionally Wrightian mode where you are in this compressed environment and then you enter into this uh, double height great room, um, uh, that's something that she was co-creating with Wright. Um, uh, and, and sort of made what were, of course, very expensive, but still relatively urban and smaller homes feel grander and, and, and more impressive. But like I said, she is known for her drawings. Um, when you think about Wright, often one of the first things that people think of, besides the beauty of, this spa of these spaces, are the gorgeous presentation drawings. And those are Marian's. Um, she's the one who, did, who came up with, uh, with the design. Wright asked her to come up with a kind of creative way to present drawings, and she borrowed from Japanese printmaking and Japanese aesthetics uh, to create these, uh, these detailed drawings that 
even though they do include detail, ultimately tell you a lot more of the feeling of the building than the specifics. Um, she also very kind of creatively used nature as a scrim to kind of set the buildings within a natural environment. Um, and that's something that um, once she left his studio, he continually hired drafts people to replicate. Um, so it becomes known as the Frank Lloyd Wright style, but she originates it. Um, and it ultimately becomes sort of representation. The, the way that architecture is represented in the United States comes from this, from this motif. Um, like I said, she did design buildings um, uh, for the Wright Studio. They were in charge of, a, of a, a community development called Millican Place, and she did three of the houses. Um, I'm gonna talk about two of them here. This is the Robert Mueller house. Um, this is, again, uh, in Decatur, Illinois. Um, and then this is the Adolph Mueller house. Robert and Adolph were brothers um, and developers. Um, and you can see here, again, that influence uh, by Japanese architecture, something that, um, that Wright and, and Marion shared. Um, she had a real interest in gabled roofs, which uh, also, I think, sometimes set her apart from some of her other prairie school companions. Oh, oops. It's a <laughs> joke. Um, uh, uh, she also, <laughs> she, that, that gable, she, she, she becomes obsessed with the shape, and she just repeats it again and again. So you can see that that kind of gabled roof line becomes a triangle that gets replicated um, in the roof line again, and then the, that, that doorway, um, and then even the inverted triangle in the art glass. Um, it is at the Wright Studio where she meets uh, Walter Burley Griffin, um, uh, and they fall in love, working together on projects. She describes being, quote, swept off my feet in delight in his achievements in, in, in the profession, uh, then through a common bond of interests and intellectual pursuits, and then with the man himself. It was by no means a case of love at first sight, but it was a madness when it struck. <laughs> um, they set out on their own, breaking away from Wright in 1911, which is also the same year they get married, in part because Marion, um, who again had this fiery relationship with Wright, feels betrayed. Uh, uh, she's good friends with Wright's wife, Catherine, and at this point, um, Wright has, has abandoned Catherine for Mamet Cheney, um, his lover, and so she is done with Wright. Um, she also constantly fought with him for credit within the, the Park Studio. Um, so Walter and Marion marry and begin to, des to design in partnership under Walter's name. Um, they uh, share a love for the Prairie School, but also for landscape and nature. Walter trained as a landscape architect, and uh, uh, Marion was a, um, an avid gardener herself. Um, and when we look at their buildings, they are often embedded not just uh, in response to nature, but within it. Um, sometimes there's this sense that you won't even notice their building until you're right on top of it. One of their early projects is um, a development called uh, Rock Glen or Rock Crest in Mason City, Iowa. Um, this is the Nelson House, which is one of the lead homes. Um, they designed the whole neighborhood, uh, only built some of the homes within it, other architects did other projects, but designing a whole neighborhood becomes um, practice for their much larger city planning that they do as a couple. Um, you can see in the Nelson House the use of material from the environment. Um, that kind of rocky outpost almost becomes the house. Um, uh, and you can also see this uh, presentation drawing uh, vertical, which is also something that, uh, that um, she really liked to do, uh, where you can see kind of the placement where, of where it is in the neighborhood at the bottom. And then as you work your way up, you see the river and then the house kind of emerging from the landscape. Um, another one of these vertical drawings, this building was never built, um, but uh, you see the front of the house at the top and then the plan and then the cross section. So you sort of experience the drawing the way you would experience the home. Uh, walking up to the front door, um, entering, feeling the layout, and then being within it in the cross section. So uh, they're, the, the Griffins are making a career for themselves in the United States, and then um, uh, Marion hears about uh, a competition to design the capital city of Australia, the federal capital, uh, Canberra, um, and uh, she convinces Walter that they should submit. Um, they submit these versions of these plans. These are, are copies of what they actually submit. Um, and it is submitted, it's her drawing that they submit, which is this massive silk, drawing on silk with watercolor. Um, and the committee is so blown away by the beauty of the illustrations, um, by the sumptuousness of the colors, and by the way that the uh, city really respects and uh, fits into the, the, the landscape and pay, pays homage to kind of the fierce beauty of Australia, uh, that they, they really credit the drawings with, with being what makes them um, select the Griffins. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Walter heads to, I'm actually going to stay here uh, for a second. Walter heads to, to Canberra um, or to, to Australia to begin the project, and Marion follows a year later. Um, and they, make, they strike a deal with the federal government of Australia that they can spend half their time working on the city and the other half their time uh, taking private commissions. And they become so successful that Walter eventually heads up the Sydney office and Marion takes control of the Melbourne office. And that's important because. If Marion is in charge of the Melbourne office, I think you can assume that the commissions in Melbourne are mostly hers. And that's what I want to talk about. These three major commissions that I feel pretty confident crediting, crediting to her. Conveniently, they're also some of the best. Uh, um, I don't want to make it seem like I don't like Walter. I do. I think he's an incredibly talented architect. Um, but Marion's my girl, and that's what I'm focusing on. Um, Cafe Australia uh, is, a, is a commission that's completed in 1916. It is an um, upper class uh, a restaurant meant to be um, a gathering place for the social elite of Melbourne. Um, and uh, Marion hires uh, two women artists, um, Bertha Murfield, who is a, a muralist, and uh, um, Margaret Baskerville, uh, a, a sculptor, to create uh, interior decorations. And you can see that, it's, it's hard to see, but the very back in that um, arch, in the, in the sort of half circle, there's a mural, and that is Bertha doing her work about the Australian landscape. Um, the Griffins, and Marion in particular, uh, are very invested in the idea of local design. So the idea of taking the Prairie School and bringing it to Australia doesn't mean replicating the Prairie School. It means, in the same way that the Prairie School was interested in the local uh, environment, so too should an Australian Prairie School be interested in the Australian local environment. And so that's what you see um, in these works. Um, she also designs the furniture. Um, unlike Frank Lloyd Wright, she does not screw it to the floor, uh, making it impossible to move around uh, because she understands that her clients might have different needs. Um, she's also responsible, the, the, the Griffins, and I think again, Marion at the lead, is responsible for Newman College at the University of Melbourne, uh, which was a residential college. Um, it is this sort of marriage of neo Gothic and Art Deco architecture, um, and that sort of central dome uh, looks like a cathedral but is a dining hall. Um, personally, I actually studied abroad at the University of Melbourne, and I had friends who lived at Newman, at Newman College, and uh, having been inside of it, it has this really wonderful combination effect where it is both residential in scale, but also kind of a very reverential environment, um, which I think is a remarkable um, uh, balance to strike. Um, and then perhaps her greatest accomplishment in Australia um, is the Capitol Theatre um, on Swanston Street in the Central Business District in Melbourne. Um, this is um, a, a major project for the for the Griffins, um, and uh, the kind of the the centerpiece of it is uh, the ceiling in the auditorium. Um, it is uh, one where the, uh, the decoration is a, a series of plaster crystal forms uh, that sort of jut out from the walls, almost like uh, stalagmites, stalactites, which are the ones that come from the top? Tights. Tights, thank you. Um, but each plaster form obscures a complicated lighting system of different colors. Um, and then the, 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 the lights ref, uh, project lighting and the, the colors reflect off of the plaster, creating this sort of symphony of colors. Um, uh, Marion writes, uh, this array of beautiful alabaster prisms constructed about a ceiling and sidewalls of the auditorium where the, structures, uh, the structure of the features is an art of itself. Um, each block of prisms has to be exactly molded and securely installed in the proper position so as to bring out the beautiful shades and coloring of the indirect lighting effects. This is an original design drawing um, for an early stage of the project and then you can see how it sort of changes um, in its manifestation in the theater. Um, but really where you get the full effect is in the lights, is when it's, when it's lit. Um, it, the lights change uh, from, the, the, the lights in their organization are a mix of red, green, violet, yellow, um, and then where they overlap, creating this mix, um, a kaleidoscope of colors. And really it's a, it's a transportive experience for theater, which is itself transportive. And so there's a, there's a sympathy there. Um, this is a chandelier from the theater, not obviously from the center part, but from the sides underneath the boxes. Um, this is in our collection. Um, they were the, the theater was um, partially uh, remodeled in the 1960s, and these were removed. And so we have one, and there's another in a museum in Australia. Um, um, and every part of the theater is meticulously decorated down to the exit signs. Wow. 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 
Um, the Griffins are hugely successful in Australia, um, but they also really struggle with the commission for the city of Canberra. Um, uh, World War I interrupts the plan and the budgets shrink, um, so it becomes a much smaller project. Ultimately, uh, the Griffins um, are frustrated by the federal government's bureaucracy and what they feel is their mistreatment, and so they quit the project. So the city of Canberra is ultimately laid out on the plan that the, Gr that the Griffins came up with, but the buildings themselves were not ultimately designed by the Griffins. So there's a loss there. Um, uh, but the landscaping, uh, the urban landscaping of the city was their plan. And so if you are in Canberra and you, you notice beautiful landscaping, thank Walter and Marianne. Um, uh, despite disappointment uh, in Canberra, they stay in Australia for decades. Uh, but in 1936, they, are, uh, they submit a design for a library at the University of Lucknow in, in, in India. Um, they relocate and spend a year there designing buildings throughout the region. Um, uh, they are both really invested in the idea of, again, this local, uh, local regional design. Uh, they want something that feels, quote, quite Indian, and yet is the last word of modernism, end quote, a sort of localized modernism, if you will. Um, sadly, though, Griffin dies of periantitis in early 1937, uh, five days after emergency gallbladder surgery, um, and is buried in India. Uh, Marion oversees the completion of uh, this building, which sadly no longer stands, um, uh, which is one of, another one of her projects, I believe, um, and then returns first to Australia and then to the United States. Um, she develops some more city plans, but by this point she's in her 60s and she's also um, dealing with uh, uh, early onset dementia. Um, so she returns to the United States, like I said, uh, in 1939, and in the first kind of 10 years of her time back in the US, before the dementia gets too bad, um, she's compiling a 1400 page manuscript. Um, it's titled Magic of America, and it's part memoir, part scrapbook, part letter collection. It's kind of incomprehensible. There are three copies of it um, that are, have overlapping content, but not identical content. Um, one's at the Art, uh, New York Historical Society, two are at the Art Institute. A group of hero archivists um, combined them and figured out what was the duplicate and what was different, and then digitized it. So if you ever want to see it, 1,400 pages available online. Um, but you can see here, this is the frontispiece, uh, I mean the, the cover page and then the frontispiece. And when I say that she sublimated her work, I mean that in her 1,400 page manuscript, she constantly gives Walter, uh, not the credit necessarily for specific projects, but sings his praises as an architect and underplays her own contributions. Even in the frontispiece, his picture is featured, not hers. Um, and so, this is something that I, I find fascinating and also, um, like I said, mysterious. Um, how do we marry this idea of this passionate woman architect who said that women need to uh, work on Saturdays and Sundays and advocate for themselves and get as much done as they possibly can and this needs to be their life's achievement and their life's work. Um, someone who fought constantly with Frank Lloyd Wright for recognition how do, we, how do we come to terms with that and her apparent comfort with, with giving Walter all of the credit? Um, I think that ultimately this reflects her work style and her priorities. Um, she wanted credit from Frank Lloyd Wright in part because she didn't have uh, uh, intellectual freedom under him. Um, but with Walter, she found a partner, someone to balance her own passions, and also, frankly, to defer to her, um, as he often did. Um, uh, and with that kind of support, she didn't need the recognition from a society that I think ultimately she knew she wasn't going to get it from. Um, and so instead, she found comfort and satisfaction and intellectual engagement in this partnership. Um, and I think that there's a kind of victory to that for this uh, first um, and only uh, female architect of the Prairie School. Wow. Thank you. Um, 
uh, ways news, frankly, I didn't recognize, um, uh, saw her as an inspiration. Um, they, they often credited her as sort of the loudest voice in the room. Um, uh, but I don't, uh, the Griffin's influence in Australia um, uh, was felt in the sheer number of projects that they did, but I don't know that very many architects followed in their footsteps. Similarly in India, um, a lot of their projects in India no longer stand, actually. And so they have this curious thing where they're really interested in establishing like a local style, um, but then of course the architects who they train and who work in their, in their studios who are locals then create their own styles, and that's frankly a, a more accurate local style than what they were doing. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't know that that's, I don't know that there's been much work connecting specifically Marion to an influence on other architects, except of course from the drawings, which, you know, if you, if you renovate a bungalow today, you're going to get designs from your architect that look like Marion designs. That's the influence, ultimately. Any other questions? So, so the boss of the portfolio that was done. Her drawings. Those were. And the, uh, the story, I mean, my, what I've always heard is that he went to Germany and actually did the drawings himself over a period of a number of years. No. I, the, the, what, I've, what I read and um, is that she was doing a lot of them. Yeah. And, they were, they were and they were also sending drawings back and forth. I mean, I, I don't want to say that this is just him cribbing off of Mary. And I, right. you know, they did have a, a working relationship. Did they, did she and Walter have children? No, no, no children. Buildings, but not children. Uh, <laughs> she was also, I mean, she was 40 when they got married. Um, uh, so she was, she spent much of her life single. Yes. Um, I know that Frank Lloyd Wright spent time in Japan and collected Japanese art and textiles and all sorts of accessories and stuff. Did she have any direct uh, contact with Japan? Not in the way that, that, that Wright did. I mean, she was exposed to kind of Japanese art as it was presented in the United States, but I don't believe she traveled to Japan. I don't think she had that same level of engagement, but they did both share an interest in it. What, what um, did they fight about? <laughs> That's a great question. She doesn't write about the details of their fights in her 1,400-page manuscript. Um, where she does, I couldn't. I, I didn't read all 1,400 pages, so I can't be sure. But I didn't notice anything about that. Um, uh, but I think they fought about everything. Definitely a lot about credit. Um, uh, of course, when you work in an architecture studio underneath an architect, I don't know that you can expect to get a ton of credit. But as a woman, she got even less than her colleagues did. Um, uh, she was also, uh, um, I think, considered one of the more talented architects working under him. And so I think maybe she found that even more frustrating. So it wasn't about design or things like that? I think, uh, I don't know. I'm sure it was about everything. It seems like she argued with a lot of people <laughs> about a lot of things. Uh, to each of you, were, I assume you just selected one architect for, for this session. Were these the obvious choices? Were there others you considered? And, and why did you choose these? Uh, well, we thought maybe also Eileen Gray would have been an interesting architect. But we thought to, to look uh, for uh, some more unknown uh, architects just because that's our mission at the museum. Right. And, uh, and then I thought it was interesting, this connection uh, that the Amsterdam School uh, as it's in. Uh, so we don't talk about Art Deco in, uh, in the Netherlands because it's really like uh, what, what covers that period is the Amsterdam School. So I thought it was interesting, this connection. And I will also say that um, for those who've been up to the sixth floor and seen Universe of Things, um, the selection of those objects, some of those were pulled from a book, Founder's Choice, that Mickey Wilson wrote in, in collaboration with Lee Nicholas. And the light fixture from the Capitol Theater in our collection was one of the objects that Mickey had picked for the book that we couldn't fit into the show. Um, and so it felt important to find a way to talk about the light fixture and about, um, and, and you know, in our, in our records and in the book, we credit it to both of them because again, it's impossible to know uh, who did what. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about Marion um, after knowing that. that and the history. images for both architects are really stunning. Is, is there increased interest in both of them now, uh, academically, or, or not really? Uh, well, actually, uh, for uh, Marion, uh, uh, <laughs> Margaret Kropoller, 
Yes, um, uh, she was very active. I mean, I just I stopped to talk about her because I wanted to talk about uh, the 1920s and early 30s and uh, you know when the war in, uh, in the Netherlands. I mean, it was uh, <coughs> invaded and. Uh, uh, but she was very active and uh, always uh, with the mostly like a very famous project by her was uh, starting in the 30s but then I realized after uh, the war uh, in the 1950s a house for a single uh, it, it, had, it was supposed to be for single women then it became for single people but it was a, a really important project from uh, the 1960s uh, Actually, much more uh, modern and uh, like more uh, functionalist architecture, and uh, there was an award now that was organized. Uh, it's been uh, just uh, starting in uh, 2016, but uh, I wasn't sure about this association. I I found it online, so I didn't want to give uh, any information, which was not. It was all in Dutch, and even with uh, <laughs> Google Translate, it was a bit difficult. So. Anyway, she's still uh, considered, uh, I mean, she was really the only uh, architect of the Amsterdam School, woman architect, and she was very well respected by all uh, the other colleagues. And I think that um, Marian is experiencing a bit of a, of a resurgence. Um, she was, she was no, well known in her time, especially in the United States. Um, uh, but um, Brickley Wright is perennially popular, right? And at a certain point, you ran out of things to say about him. Um, and, and he's also been sort of there's been this reevaluation of his, of his, uh, I think, reputation as a human being, separate from his architecture, um, which then gets people investigating the other figures in his life. That um, brings up Marion, who is this like intellectual partner slash like nemesis. She certainly felt like they were enemies by the end of their working relationship. I don't know if he cared. <laughs> We've got time for one more question. Um, in 1998, I saw the show at the University of Phoenix. And it was supposedly all of Frank Lord Wright's drawings. And it was that drawing that you the word wow. yeah. And it was yeah. all these drawings about jet, like the things you saw in Japan and how it was. And now, since you, to your point, you're saying that those were probably her drawings. Certainly the early ones were. I mean, once she leaves his studio, she's right. not doing his drawings. Um, but she, is, she sets the tone. And he asks her to. I mean, he says, research a style. Come up with something that that feels organically us, but also, I'm, and I'm sure he, I'm, you know, again, they were collaborators. I'm sure they were going back and forth about how Japanese it should feel and blah, blah, blah. But yes, it's her hand, and it's, I think, to a large degree, her her creativity at the beginning. Again, later on, it's other people. Thank you. One more question for, for Sylvia. Uh, what was the, was there any direct relationship between Black Hopper and Berlach? Um, uh, he, he was kind of instigator of the Amsterdam School. He was uh, like um, he's before the Amsterdam School, and uh, he was uh, like his uh, architecture was much more austere uh, compared to the Amsterdam School. That's why usually they say that Kuipers who was uh, like his rival was more like the mentor of the Amsterdam School. But still, I mean, they uh, started all of them from the arts and crafts, uh, and so. For sure, he was one of their mentors, and so he did the plan for the south part of Amsterdam. When uh, uh, and one of the projects by the, Ams uh, the Amsterdam School was uh, just uh, started from uh, one of his uh, plans. So for sure, he was like the um, yeah the mentor for many of them. But then uh, some of them uh, criticized him, and uh, some of them uh, appreciated him. So. Thank you. Thank you.